Welcome to the Wisdom That Breathes channel. Across all our platforms, we try to share wisdom which is relevant and accessible to everyone. But on this particular platform, we go deeper into some of the ancient principles found within the scriptures. If you find some of the terminology difficult or inaccessible, then go over to our Keshava Swami YouTube channel where you'll be able to find other content which is perhaps more relatable. Thank you and enjoy the wisdom that breathes. Much. Yeah, it's wonderful to be here. After an introduction like that, it's like no pressure. <laughs> I'm really happy to be here. Uh, Yadavendra Prabhu is very kind and uh, I think we'll have a fruitful discussion here this, uh, this evening. In the room, we're all here. You know, in our hearts and minds, so many questions come up about life, about meaning, about happiness, about our future. Um, everyone is always asking questions and so I suggested to Yadav that why don't we just have an evening of questions and um, he's going to ask me some questions. I hope they're going to be not too hard. Uh, I'll try my best to respond but uh, we'll also give all of you an opportunity to like open your heart and ask whatever questions may be there because those questions are like a key and when you ask those questions um, then what can happen is it can open up doors of understanding that open new worlds for you to explore. So, uh, yeah, I hope it will be a beautiful evening and looking forward to it. So here's what I'm going to request, okay? Anyone who has a question, sometimes what happens is we have a question and there's no one to ask that question to, right? And sometimes what we do is end up going to Google and asking that question, which is sometimes even worse, right? So, here's what I'm going to do, okay? Can I please give all of you about 60 to 75 seconds just to really think to yourself if you can recall any questions which you've had in recent times, whether it's about life, spirituality, and maybe you could just jot it down on your phone quickly, um, if that's okay. And then what we'll do is after the initial few questions, then we'll open up the floor. And don't worry about what your question may sound like. It doesn't matter because, to be honest, we've all gone through phases where we think our question is stupid, but for us it's not stupid or it's not silly. It's actually very relevant for us. And I've also often seen people ask very personal questions, but in public. It's actually quite liberating. Okay, in the right setting, and I, I really feel like this is the right setting, in a setting of well-wishers, in a spiritual setting. So even if you have questions which pain your heart a little bit, don't worry, just, just ask them. And you'll see that vulnerability will come out in a really nice way, and it may even encourage someone else who's a little bit vulnerable but shy to also ask their questions. So can I give everyone about 60 to 75 seconds, starting from now, if that's okay. Is that enough time for everyone to have put their question down on their phone or in their mind? Okay. So, um, so Keshav Maharaj, first, um, today, I'd like to start with a few questions. We can get a little technical later. But the first thing is, I guess it's good for people who don't know you to know you a little bit. Okay? So, can I ask you first, what was your journey like into spirituality? How did you come into spirituality? Was there anything that made you decide that you wanted to come into spirituality? Was it an accident? Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, my story starts in Wembley. All good stories start in Wembley. <laughs> so I was born in London, I was born in the suburbs of London, and I didn't grow up like reading books of wisdom. I grew up coming to a temple, but it was very ritualistic. 
But it was when I was 15 that many questions started coming to my mind. Now people ask me, why was it at 15 that all these questions of life began coming to your mind? And it's a difficult question to answer. But what I think it was, was when I was a kid, I used to watch TV, as all good kids do. And when I used to see the news, and when I used to see people suffer, when I saw kids who were starving, or families who were in wars, or people who had undergone like some natural earthquake or some natural disaster, when I saw suffering, it just didn't sit with me. I was like, why do people have to suffer? That just doesn't make any sense at all. We wake up in the morning and nobody wants to suffer. Yet everyone suffers in some way. And it was just too painful to my heart to like watch people suffering. And so I think that was what made me question because I was just like, if there's a God up there, he ain't doing his job well. I need to give him some advice. <laughs> So I was wondering, like, why do bad things happen to good people? And maybe I think some of it was that I was scared that that suffering was going to come to me at one point because I had a good upbringing. I didn't really have any challenges. So when I was 15, I had like questions. And so I actually went to the library and I got three copies of the Bhagavad Gita out, different copies. And I brought them home and I basically didn't understand any of them. And then someone gave me Bhagavad Gita as it is, my best friend. Um, and then I started reading it, and if I'm honest, I didn't understand anything. But it, it was very interesting because it was the first time in my life that I read a book, I didn't understand it, and I was like, wow, this is amazing. It was, it was kind of like a strange thing. I read the Bhagavad Gita, I didn't even understand it, and I was like, there's something amazing in this book, but I have no idea, like I need to learn more. So then I used to start coming into the temple and then I used to um, meet the monks, meet the monks in orange. And so every Sunday I used to come into the temple and it was like debunk the monk, like ask the monks all the questions. So then I would fire questions like, why do bad things happen to good people? How can you prove God exists? What about life after death? Um, and then when I went to university, my spiritual hunger grew. And then when I graduated, I was 21 and I was like, I could go into a job, but I feel like I have something different that I'm meant to do with my life. So I decided to go to India, and I went to India for six months when I was 21, and I traveled around and uh, told my mom, I'm coming back, I'm going to get married soon, just need a bit more time. And then I came back to London when I was 21 still, and, uh, and then I joined the temple. I became a monk in the monastery for one year. And what can I say? I loved it so much. It was just like the best life. Simple, uh, no stress, and deeply spiritual. And I found it to be my calling. And so, yeah, I've been a monk now for, I guess, like coming up to 25 years now. But can I ask why? <clears throat> you were 15, you had all these questions. But. If I understand it correctly, you come from a Jain background, right? Like your name was Sandeep Shah, right? So what made you want to go to the temple that you were going to, to ask those questions? Why didn't you go to another temple? Why this particular one? Yeah, I grew up with some Jain influence. It was almost like a little bit of everything. <laughs> It was a bit of what we call a kitchri, for those of you who are familiar. Uh, so we had a lot of different influences. Why did I go to the Hare Krishna temple for answers and not any of the other temples? I guess they had the best food. <laughs> so I was like, uh, okay, I can ask my questions and also get 
good food. Um, but no, I also had some friends there who were going to that temple, and so I guess that was the natural place to go as well. And so moving on from there, you, you became a monk, um, or a, 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 what they call a brahmachari. And as you were growing up, like, as in, sorry, spiritually, you know, growing up um, at the temple, so the first year, you know, you said you had a, um, a really kind of nice time, like your heart just felt happy and it felt peaceful. Did it ever change? Living in a temple has its struggles. First thing is we had to wake up every day at 4 a.m. And what happens is you live in a dormitory with 30 other monks, and that means 30 alarm clocks. And it's interesting because the guy who sets his alarm clock the earliest is the one who sleeps the deepest. And so, like, I was like, every morning I'd be up early, I was like, do you really have to do this to be spiritual? Like, can't we start spirituality at nine o'clock in the morning? I mean, it's more humane. So, getting up in the morning was difficult. Uh, living with others is not always easy, because, you know, like, you don't get along with everyone. Sometimes I used to look around in the ashram where we stayed, and I was like, if it wasn't for spirituality, I wouldn't hang around with any of these people. We're so different. So it was tough. There were difficulties. Um, and then sometimes there were doubts. Sometimes I was like, is what I'm doing real? Have I been brainwashed? I remember one morning I came into the Bhagavatam class. We have a, a class on the scriptures every morning. And I remember having this thought, like, oh my God, have I just been brainwashed? Like, and it was, but then like 15 minutes later, it was breakfast, so I was all right. <laughs> um, and then there were challenges from my family. Because my mom and dad were expecting me to get a job, to be a good son, to be a doctor, or a lawyer, and not a failure. <laughs> and, uh, but in a nice way, I really appreciate My parents gave me everything. They were the ones who introduced me to spirituality and uh, the tradition of Krishna consciousness. But when I took it that seriously, it was like, okay, don't go too deep. So that was difficult. I think if a path doesn't have any obstacles, if a path doesn't have any opposition, any challenges, then it probably means you're walking a path that isn't going anywhere significant. So I was like, there's a lot of obstacles here, but that's good. That means I'm probably going somewhere significant. So I navigated them. And <clears throat> one thing I've noticed, like when you when you speak, you know, you, you reference Srila Prabhupada quite, quite a lot. And that's natural because he's the founder of the movement. All our books are based on him. So I think without even saying it, Srila Prabhupada is probably the strongest influence, right, in your life like the books. But what I also would like to know, and maybe some of us would like to know this as well, apart from Srila Prabhupada, who is that one person who you've really looked up to um, in your spiritual life. So that's the first part. And what is it, so who and what is it about them that really inspired you? Of course, there could be many, many answers to that question. But today I'll share with you someone who really inspired me in my life. I could tell you about my gurus, my spiritual teachers, my mentors, who are huge influences, but I'll tell you about someone different. About 10 years after I joined the monastery, another young monk, another young uh, youth, he joined. His name was Janakina. He had studied at King's College. and. Uh, he had come to Africa, actually. He was traveling, for those of you who know, Tribhuvanath Prabhu, 
and the festival team. He actually traveled with that festival program across East Africa because he really wanted to do charity work. He really wanted to help people. So he became a monk. And uh, I always saw him as my little kid brother, you know, so I would like make fun of him and teach him stuff. And he always kind of looked up to me. Of course, I was double his height as well, so he had to. Um, but of course, because I was 10 years older in the ashram to him. But he became a huge inspiration for me because what happened one day, um, he had a lot of stomach pains. So, uh, you know, he was always a very resilient person, so he never thought much about it. But the stomach pains got so bad that he had to go to hospital. So he went to hospital and uh, he went in for a checkup. And I was somewhere else. And I remember this day very, very vividly in my mind. He called me on his phone. And I saw his name and I picked it up. And he said, uh, where are you? I said, I'm just out in such and such place. He said, just go to a quiet place. So I went to a quiet place. And he said, I've just uh, got the results of... Uh, the test that they did on me, and uh, I have stage 4 cancer. And he was like 31 years old. And I was just like, my head was spinning, I was like, and it was not just cancer, it was stage 4 cancer, that's very advanced. So I, so I didn't know what to say to him, I just said like, okay, you just I'll meet you back at the temple in two hours, like, you get back, I'll get back and we'll speak there. So all the way I was driving back, I was thinking, what am I going to say to him? How am I going to help him? How am I going to offer comforting words? And then I got back in the temple two hours later. He was in the room. And I walked into the room and I was wondering, like, what do you say to someone who's just found out they have stage four cancer and maybe have like a certain number of years to live in their life? And I came in the room. And he was sitting on the seat with his like legs on the uh, bed, like relaxed, like watching uh, something on the laptop and he had a drink in his and I was like, <laughs> he just looked like the most relaxed person in the world. And he looked at me and he said, life is unpredictable. You never know what's going to happen next. But he said, everything happens for a purpose. And so there's going to be something amazing that comes from this. And he looked at me and he said, I'm ready for an adventure. And I was just like, wow. In the challenge, the greatest challenge of his life, his character, his incredible uh, faith, his devotion, his positivity, his resilience, his grace, all of that came out. And so, uh, his journey was amazing. He lived for another five years. I wrote all about his life in a book. I wrote a book about him called Loving Life, Embracing Death. And the quality about him that really stood out for me was that he woke up every single day from bed enthusiastic about life. He woke up every single day like he loved life, he loved to get up, he loved to be out there, loved to do things. And he just had so much purpose in his life. So sometimes we tell people the best alarm clock in the world is purpose. Because when your eyes open and you have something you want to do in the world, then you just jump out of bed. And so I really admired him because it didn't matter what happened in life, he never lost his enthusiasm to get up in the morning and just do stuff in the world. And uh, he had that purpose because he had a deep spiritual realization. So I share so many of the lessons that I learned from his life in that book. Um, but yeah, I saw him in the, in the beginning like my younger brother. But later on I realized he was my guru, he was my teacher, because he actually taught me how to live life. And we were with him at the final moment when he left the world. I don't know how many of you have ever been with someone in the final moment when they leave this world. But it was the most incredible experience to see how a soul leaves the world like completely content, completely uh, at peace 
and ready to embrace the next chapter of life with no fear. And it was just the most incredible thing to see. So yeah, he was uh, someone who gave me great inspiration. That's quite amazing, what you just shared. I think that's very powerful. And I think maybe some of the people who are here are going to take a lot from that. Um, moving on a little bit, you know, you said you had uh, doubts at, you know, sometimes, and you know, you go through these phases of I've been brainwashed, you know, you, you doubt that, you know, is this really the right thing that I've gotten myself into? Um, just to share something a little bit funny with you, um, Burijan Prabhu was one day speaking with my father in Perth, and we were all listening. And he was telling us about his adventures. So for those of you who don't know, Burijan Prabhu writes a lot of commentaries um, on the Srimad Bhagavatam at the moment. He started the Vrindavan Institute for Higher Education. So my father was speaking to him. He lives between Perth and Vrindavan. So he was explain, uh, describing his adventures. And when, you know, the extraordinary things that Srila Prabhupada's disciples did at that particular time, right? Like people like us sit there and think, how did you do that? Right? That's, that's extraordinary. And so then my father asked him, he goes, did you ever doubt the, the philosophy at that time or what you were getting into? He goes, no. He goes, I think like that now. He goes, but not then, when I was 21 years old. But obviously he was just having some fun. So my question to you is, if you could, could you share a moment which, or any incident which made you think in your heart that I am now not in a place of doubt anymore, that this path is an extremely powerful path that I have come across. And your faith almost like, you know, you have those moments where you transcend to your next level. Um, did you have anything like that? And if you could share that with us, if that's okay. So you're asking for a mystical experience. Uh, inner mystical. Inner mystical. I think many things happen in my life which definitely prove to me that there is an active God who is listening. It, and it could be something small. So for example, when we, we sleep in the monastery, so we sleep on the floor, so that you don't have any fixed space, you just wherever you find the space, you go down. So, but I used to always reserve the space by the bookshelf. Because I was convinced that if I put my head next to the bookshelf every night, then mystically all that knowledge is going to go in there. <laughs> so that was my theory. So I used to sleep by the bookshelf. So one night, what I did is I was, I, I was about to lie down, and because I was next to the bookshelf, I took a Bhagavad Gita out. So I opened the Bhagavad Gita to a random verse, and the verse was 1515. And in that verse, Krishna says, from me, so Krishna is speaking God, he says, from me comes knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness. So I thought, knowledge, that comes from God, that makes sense. Remembrance, God inspires you. Forgetfulness, how does God make you forget? Like, so I was just contemplating that point, that what does it mean that forgetfulness comes from God? So I was contemplating that thought. Anyway, I fell asleep. And it was very interesting because as I was contemplating that thought, I fell asleep. I woke up in the morning to my alarm clock. Those were the days of like Nokia 5210s and all of those, you know, the dumb phones. Uh, um, so the alarm went off on my phone. And what you have to do to turn the alarm off on that phone is you have to put in your pin. So I put in the pin and it rejected. And I was like, how can it reject my pin? There's something wrong with this phone. So I put the pin in again and it rejected. And I was like, I've had this phone for like two years. Like how can I not remember my pin? 
And I was like, if I do the pin the wrong the next time, I'm going to have to like get, a, you have to get like a puck code to like unlock it. And sure enough, I put in another code and it rejected and it blocked my phone. And I was just there sitting like thinking like, how in the world did I forget my pin randomly? And then I remembered, Krishna says, from me comes knowledge, remembrance, forgetfulness. I was like, okay, <laughs> I trust you. I'll trust you more, better next time. So many, many small things like that happened, which just gave me a sense that there's an active divinity. One of our devotees, he was asked, have you ever seen God's face? And he looked back and he said, I don't know if I've seen God's face, but I see his hand every single day. And I really related to that. When I came to the temple first, I asked one of the devotees, I said, I don't know if God exists. I don't know if I believe in God. And the devotee looked at me and he said, we're not trying to convince you that God exists. And I was like, is this guy all right? Like, so I looked at him, I said, then what are you trying to do? He said, no, no, we're not trying to convince you that God exists. So I said, what are you trying to do then? He said, we're going to equip you with the tools, the spiritual practices, the processes by which you will be able to perceive the presence of God at every moment in your life. And I was like, wow, sign me up. That sounds great. And, and, and he was explaining that this is not just a belief, this is a spiritual science. Here is God, here is Krishna, but it's not just some faith. If you open your heart, if you uh, open your mind, if you reciprocate and you, uh, if you endeavor, then God reciprocates. And so I think for me, just that reciprocation, just that experience over many years convinces me that Someone is watching everything. Someone is moving everything. Someone is arranging everything. I'll just say one last thing. One thing I was really impressed. Yesterday I was talking about what impressed me about the devotees. I'll tell you another thing that really impressed me about devotees. Is they would make statements like, Oh, Krishna is playing a joke on us. Oh, Krishna is arranging this. Oh, Krishna must be trying to tell us this. They would just speak about Krishna. As though he was like their best mate, just like speaking to them on the phone or something. And my conception of God was always like, God's up there, he's like the top man, don't do anything wrong, otherwise he'll throw a thunderbolt, and like otherwise you get on with your life and he gets on with his life. But here were people speaking about God as though he was like regularly interacting with them. And that for me was like fascinating. I was like, wow, you can speak to God. God plays jokes on you. God arranges stuff in my life. But who am I? They said, no, God is active. He's alive. He's attentive. He's affectionate. And he'll acknowledge your presence if you acknowledge his presence. And I was like, that's amazing. And so over the years, I feel that, that uh, it's very real. That Krishna consciousness is not a faith. It's very real. That's nice. I'm going to ask you um, one question, and then maybe we can see if anyone else has questions. I think my first question to you would be, what is spirituality? Because interacting with so many people, the conceptions of spirituality are so vast. Like some people literally say, when I enter into my office, that's when I feel most spiritual, um, when I do my work. Some people... As to be working where they're working. <laughs> yeah. Some people, as soon as they take their earbuds and put them in their ears and they listen to the music that they like, they're like, that's when I enter spirituality. One person even told me, I become most spiritual in the evening when I pour myself a beer and I relax. He goes, this is when I am completely in touch with God, when that one pint of Tusca enters my system. And he was so serious about it, right? Bumi, I told you, don't reveal these things to the world. 
Yeah, people have so many conceptions. Yeah. So, so that's what I want to say that, you know, everyone, and obviously it's, 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 it would be very nice and diplomatic to say that, you know what, you're all right. But the truth is that spirituality from a doctrinal perspective, from a spiritual perspective, it has its definition. So what is spirituality? Yeah, it's a great question. Speakers always say it's a great question when they think they know the answer. I'll try. I guess the easiest way I'd ex respond to that is like this. There's negative, there's zero, and there's positive. Most of the world is engaged in negative energy. What do I mean by negative energy? There's frustration within them, there's anxiety, there's some level of dejection, uh, enviousness, uh, untruthfulness. Basically, most people are just struggling with the mind, isn't it? We're all struggling with the mind. Now what happens is, I think there are many activities in the world which help you to go from a negative mindset to like zero, a level of peacefulness. So for example, I read a book and that helps me come from negative to zero. Or I have a beer. For most people that's like negative to double negative. But for some people they may feel a leisurely drink brings them to zero. Or say for example someone says, I put on my earbuds and I listen to like classical music that brings them from negative to zero. And because it's bringing them higher, they feel that to be spiritual. However, real spirituality doesn't just bring you from negative to zero. What real spirituality does is it brings you from negative through zero to positive connection with a higher, deeper, more profound, eternal reality. And therefore, Reading a book will definitely make you relaxed or it will make you go to sleep, one of the two. Go, you know, going to the park will definitely make you relaxed. Listening to music will definitely make you relaxed, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's spiritual. It is uplifting you. It's taking you from negative to zero, but real spirituality doesn't just give you peace of mind, it doesn't just give you relaxation, it does, doesn't just give you a respite from the constant uh, difficulties of the mind, but it also introduces you to something much higher, much more profound. And in Sanskrit what we say is sp real spirituality gives you rasa. Other activities may give you shanti, which means some level of peace. But spirituality is not just about peace. Spirituality is about rasa. And rasa means taste, relish, uh, fulfillment of the heart, wonder of the mind, uh, love. All of these things you don't experience from these other so-called types of spirituality. So what you said takes you from negative to zero. Good. But spirituality takes you into a whole other reality that's beyond even zero. Thank you. Now, as we said, we can open up the floor to anyone who might have a question. Okay. I'll just hand them. Hare Krishna, Keshav Swami, it's an honor to have you here in Nairobi. I'm so happy. I was going to come to the manor in July and September and look for you, so thank you for coming. <laughs> and thank you so much to the Jan, uh, Jani family for inviting us. Thank you. Uh, my question is, it started, from, uh, it started from one question, it's evolved to try and place it nicely. But um, I'm, on, I'm on this path of spirituality for a very long time. I've grown up in that atmosphere. It, first of all, it was religion, Jainism, and now it's turned more into spirituality. Um, and, I'm, and so many pennies are dropping. 
meaning like aha moments, like wow and wow and wow. And I think I'm really starting, very starting to feel the rasa that you're talking about. Starting, I think. And my question is, being a mum, and they're going to kill me for this, sorry. <laughs> being a mum and a wife and a, and a daughter, a daughter-in-law. I thought you said being a monk. <laughs> <laughs> but you never know, but uh, not, not now. <laughs> um, how do you... I have an inner battle whereby I really want to bring them on this journey of this beautiful values and experience. And if you see me, I've been, I've been constantly saying, listen, listen, look at this, look at this, look at this, to be honest. Um, how do you, and I've listened to a lot, of your, a lot of your talks, how do you, what is the fine line between parenting, guiding, and allowing a soul to be a, have their own journey. Yeah. And I can already f feel the foot on my foot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, guys, this is the point of the program where your mom gets on your case. <laughs> no, she's not getting on your case. Uh, yeah, we, wanna, we have so many people in our lives. It may be your children, it may be your spouse, it may be other people who you want to inspire, you want to share your inspiration, you want them to come on the journey with you. And you want to share your heart, but at the same time, they're on their own journey. They have their own life, and uh, sometimes it's just like, Mom, I don't want to go to the temple. So how much should you be like, you're going to the temple? And how much should you just be like, okay, follow your path? Chanakya Pandit, he said one very nice thing. Here's a monk giving you parenting advice. It's kind of ironic. I'll hand over to Yadavendra, who can give the real purport later. Um, but he said, in the first five years of life, you have to give your kids a lot of love. And then in the second five years of their life, you give some discipline, and you give direction, and you give uh, good wisdom. And then he said, after you've given love and discipline, then you need to give friendship and independence. And you let them you need to let them find their own way. Um, so there's no force. Spirituality can never be forced. They say a person forced against their own will is of the same opinion still. Even at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna doesn't force Arjun. Krishna looks at Arjun, he's painstakingly told him everything that he needs to know. And then Krishna just looks at Arjun and says, Iti te jnana makyatam guyat guyataramaya vimrashe dadashe shena yathechasi tatha guru. I've given you all the knowledge. Now you think about it. Now you contemplate it, challenge it, reflect it. Yata icha. And then whatever is your desire that you do so love discipline friendship give them independence and I think the most important thing is be an inspirational example at the manor in London the parents bring their children and they drop their children off for the Krishna club in the morning the class and then they go to the cinema, the golf course, the shopping center, the restaurant, every other place, and then they come back in the evening and they're like, did you learn the Bhagavad Gita? <laughs> and I'm like, you're not going to be able to inspire them if you don't live it yourself. Because children, more than what you tell them, they look at what you're doing in your own life. And so Krishna says, yad yad, achariti, shreshtas. Whatever your achar is, whatever your behavior, that will speak loudest. And so if you're happy, if you're inspired, if you're enthused and hungry for life, then know for sure that anyone who's in contact with you will be like, what are you doing? I need to do some of that. So sometimes I tell people the biggest proof of Krishna consciousness is just be happy. <laughs> One time I was at a program and I challenged, I said, I, someone said like, I said, yeah, no one's happy in the material world. So he put his hand up, he said, no, I'm happy. I said, no, you're not. He 
He said, no, no, I'm happy. I said, no, you're not. And then he got really angry. He was like, no, I'm happy. <laughs> and I said, see, proof. You're not happy because uh, there would be no need to get aggravated. So when you're happy, you'll inspire the whole world. Srila Prabhupada said, spreading Krishna consciousness is easy business. Just show people how happy you are. So the, the happiness that we exude, I think, is the biggest message. But now let me ask Yadav to give the real answer on parenting. I don't, I don't have a real answer, but I can share just one small thing with you. And <clears throat> in 2021, um, I, for many years, I wanted to produce like a documentary on the start of spirituality right to the end of spirituality. Um, where does it start and where does it end? And up until a certain point, um, I actually got good traction. So in 2021 in April, I went with a whole crew of people to film the saints of Vrindavan who are of very high caliber. I'm talking about saints who've you know, given up everything, but also you know, some practical people. There was a whole array of different saints. So what happened was, as I was interviewing them and asking them questions, and I was positioning myself someone, as someone who knows like literally zero, I may not know a lot, but I knew something, but I pretended I knew nothing, I was like jeans and you know, just interviewing them. But in the process of that association with those saints, when I came back, right, and I, I sometimes like to speak frankly, I wasn't myself for quite some time for about a month or so. I felt like I, I didn't belong here. You know, my mind was, was just there. And I kept telling my wife that I want to move there. Yeah, I, like, you know, we're wasting time. And I got so serious that I called my daughter, Krishangi, and I said, in a few years, right, um, I said we might be moving to Vrindavan for like a year or two. Because I was telling my wife, they need to have this experience about this place. So, Krishangi, don't mind if I say this. When I said that, she was quiet for a minute, and then you just see like tears just going down her eyes, and she's like, you're going to ruin my life. <laughs> you know, just in the pursuit of your spirituality, you're ruining my life, my education. I was sitting there going, no, but it's so good for you. You can always come back and restart your education. And she, was, she just stormed off. She's like, he's gone mad. One year later, literally one year later, I just said, can we go and just spend 10 days in Vrindavan? And our habit was that we would spend 10 days, 11 days, whatever we could afford. And then we'd go on a holiday afterwards, you know, because Vrindavan can be quite austere and you kind of want it to be a little bit austere. But then we would go for a holiday to some other place. So our idea was to go from Vrindavan um, and then we were supposed to go to Udaipur. For like a few days and I didn't say anything you know we're just continuing our lives like me and Runa programs our own spiritual stuff after 10 days of being in Vrindavan just doing kind of what we do Udhav and Krishangi no force throughout the entire year no telling them you should do this you shouldn't do this right just come along with us you know be free after 10 days they both said, and we were all in one room, you know, in, in our house, it's not like a massive place, right? And this is a big house, that's not a big house, it's one room, all four of us, my legs like, you know, sticking out the bed, you know. Um, they both said, can you cancel the Udaipur trip? I'm staying in a very nice place, they're like, can you cancel it? And they cried so much. Um, because they had absolutely zero desire to leave just then and, and as they were leaving Vrindavan sorry I'm I feel like I'm sharing like home secrets but they cried leaving Vrindavan yeah and I knew exactly why because I knew the sadhus who they were remembering right so I think what I mean to say is um, the conclusion of this is just like my parents never forced me I took that from them 
that we didn't force them, we exposed them. And exposed them and let nature take its course. If we trust the Lord at some point, something will enter. We just don't know when. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, I had a question about rasa, like you said about rasa. So I wanted to ask, um, what exactly are the symptoms of rasa? Is it like I've, I've, I've seen from the biography of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, it's like during Sankirtan, like rolling on the floor during Krishna Nam and like crying. Is that what rasa actually is? And if that's so, then like let's say for example, I've I listen to some kind of kirtan that like that has a lot of ecstasy in it and then I feel like okay I'm gonna chant like properly and then I chant properly for two or three rounds but then after that I just like basically start uh, thinking about something else while chanting so is can rasa also be temporary like that or does rasa have to be permanent so that's the question wow here we have a rasika <laughs> Someone who is looking for rasa. Very good. They once asked Srila Prabhupada, what do you feel when you chant Hare Krishna? And out of all of the things Srila Prabhupada could have replied, he said, I feel no fear. He said, I feel no fear. It's a very interesting answer because perhaps fear is one of the central material emotions that consume us, isn't it? Everyone's fearful. We're fearful about the past, we're fearful about the future, we're fearful, when is this guy going to stop talking and Prashadam is going to be served? <laughs> we're fearful about what people think about us, we're fearful about our health, we're fearful about so many things. Srila Prabhupada said, I feel no fear. So the first symptom of rasa is that one is lifted outside of material emotions. Sometimes we feel fearful, sometimes we feel like uh, attracted towards temporary pleasure that we know is not good for us. Sometimes we feel envious of someone else, jealous. Sometimes we feel angry, you know, like... The first symptom of rasa is that one is lifted out of all of those emotions and you start to experience a very deep inner contentment and inner peace and inner happiness. We tell people the richest person is not the one who has the most. The richest person is the one who needs the least. But only one who's tasting rasa is so satisfied from their inner happiness that they don't require anything more. Otherwise, everyone's just trying to get more. Two houses, two cars, two phones, too much. So rasa means lifted out of your material emotions, happiness within the heart. And then when that rasa becomes more and more intensified, then it can lead to more and more acute emotions. Your hairs may stand on end. Your body may become, start to shiver. Sometimes we have these uh, moments. Uh, usually it happens when we have the flu. But sometimes we have some excitement and we experience some of this. But in someone who's experiencing spiritual taste, these emotions come much more regularly. And then there are other signs that someone has rasa. Someone has some spiritual emotion. Our great teacher Rupa Goswami, he says, Kshantir. You know one sign of someone who has rasa? Forgiveness. Usually we hold on to everything that happens in this world. Oh, that person did that to me. Or oh, that happened to me. But when you have rasa, when you're experiencing such a higher taste, 
then all the things of this world become so insignificant, you can just forgive things and move on. How many of us are holding on to some bitterness, some anger, some resentment, some bad feeling and negativity towards another person? So you need more rasa. Because it's still big for you. Why is it so big? No, no, but they said to me something 23 and a half years ago on that Monday morning. I'll never forget it. But when you have rasa, you're like, I'm here. I'm just passing through this world. It's a transit lounge. I'm going somewhere much greater. Why will I become so diverted by this? So there are so many symptoms of rasa. You want to know another sign that someone has rasa? Avyartha kalatvam. The person doesn't want to waste one moment of time. If you ever meet a person in your life who can't stand to waste one moment of time, but continuously wants to move towards uh, spiritual activity, you can understand this person has rasa. So like this, there are many, many uh, signs that are there. So it's a great study. So you have uh, another 70, 80 years in your life to study rasa and to become a rasika. What's the easiest and the quickest way to um, get rid of Is it Hari Nam Sankirtan? Or like, is there any other way that's like, uh, because uh, in the Kali Yuga, I think the only thing that's going to work the most is Hari Nam. So is it that the only thing we do is Hari Nam and no other devotional service? Or do we need to like, um, do other devotional services as well, but also Hari Nam? So what's going to get us the quickest? I mean, there's a fee to answer questions like this, you know? Like we can't just tell you all the secrets here. Sign up to my program and I'll let you know. <laughs> Three things. Nama Ruchi, the holy name. Take the name of Krishna. Nama Chintamani, Krishna, Chaitanya, Rasa, Vigraha. The name contains, the name of God, when you just say the name of God, it contains so unlimited amounts of God's sweetness. However, the teachers say, along with Nama Ruchi, Vaishnava Seva. There are, as uh, Yaravendrapu was beautifully sharing, there are saintly people in this world. And the saints are not just the ones in saffron dress. Maybe the ones in saffron dress are not so saintly also. <laughs> the saint, there are saintly people. They may be housewives, they may be working in the world, they may be children, they may be sadhus. But there are saintly people who are tasting rasa. And when you spend time with them, you catch the virus. So, Vaishnav Seva. And the third thing is, Jiva Daya. Be kind. Out there in the world, so many people are suffering. So many people, smiling faces, crying hearts. Go out there, help people, be kind, be compassionate. And when you do that, God smiles on you. Because when it becomes more than just your own life, and you want to help others, that's the most beautiful life you can lead. So there you have it. Number one. Nam Ruchi. Excellent. Make the checks payable to SP Keshava Swami. All major credit cards accepted. Can also like you guys can also challenge us, you know, like you don't have to accept what we're saying. We're also we were ready, we came with some boxing gloves. We thought you guys are gonna challenge us a little bit. Yes.
Hare Krishna Maharaj. Just a follow-up question. What you've all mentioned, but there's something that always leads us down, and that's Maya. So can you just touch on that fact of Maya? Because whatever you just said about uh, Nam Ruchi and all that, but Maya is always around us. And Okay, yeah. So just to frame it, for some of you who may not be familiar with the Vedic terminology, in Eastern philosophy, there is a concept of Maya. So Maya means like an illusory energy. So like we're in this world, but you know, like sometimes people say, something came over me, isn't it? And then usually you hear about the terrible thing that they did after that. You know, like, Why did you do that? They said, something came over me. So basically what they're talking about is Maya. So there's this energy in the world today that sometimes comes over you. Have you experienced that energy? No. Every day. Right? Like we're like, you know, like sometimes in the cartoon they used to have like the, the angel here and then like the devil here. There's like, and then there's a confused person in between like, oh, what should I do? So this Maya is there, this temptation, this uh, energy which seems to cover our intelligence, right? So how do we deal with that Maya? So there's a very beautiful verse. Krishna Surya Sama Hoya Maya Andhakar Yaha Krishna Taha Nahi Maya Radhikar Maya, illusion, is like darkness. Krishna, divinity, God, is like the sun. Yaha Krishna, wherever there is that divine person, the presence of God. Maya Radhika, Nahi Maya Radhika, Maya cannot exist. So the trick is, you have to try to bring the presence of God into every aspect of your life. That desire must come, that whatever I'm doing, I always try to invoke the presence of divinity. But what happens in our life is we're like, oh, I did so many spiritual things, now I need a break, you know. I need a break from all this, you know, Hare Krishna stuff, you know. Like, I did my bit for the day, you know. Now I just got to like relax, you can't be fanatical, you know. And then what happens, is if you leave that space, what do they say in English? An idle mind is the devil's workshop. So sometimes the art of life is to fill your life with divinity. Whatever you're doing, making it, make it spiritual. And um, like that, like in India you see it, isn't it? Like they somehow they just make... God, Krishna, part of everything. Like the rickshaw driver, to hell with the speedometer. Why do you even need a speedometer? Pull it out. Put a picture of Krishna there. <laughs> no, no, but you need to follow the speed limit. No, that's all right. Fill the life. Fill. Yena, teena, prakarena, mana, Krishna, nivesha, yet. Somehow or other, bring Krishna in. So, make your desktop picture Krishna. Change your passwords, Krishna 108. I'll give you a tip. You can hack into any devotee's email. <laughs> Anyone. Anyone. Krishna 108. When you're in, going, moving somewhere, chant the name of Krishna. Bring divinity in. When you're with friends, bring up some spiritual topic. No, no, but I can't speak to all these people. They're going to think I'm like brainwashed religious person. Be smart. You can bring up spirituality with anyone. Because you know what? Everyone is looking for God. That's the amazing thing. Every single person is looking for God. But the expert person knows how to bring God into the conversation without alienating the other person in a very, very smart way. So like that, the more you bring uh, 
divinity into every aspect of your life, Krishna. I'm saying divinity because here in this room we may have different names that we use. Nam, Nam, Akari, Bahuda. God has so many names. So you call God Krishna, or Allah, or Jehovah, or Yahweh, or whatever you call. But the point is, bring God in. What do you think? Is it reasonable? Or is it utopian? Okay. Then you, now you'll get prashad at the end of the program. <laughs> but do you think we can do that? Isn't it? Like you, you, you just make Krishna more present in your life. But what we do is we're psychological atheists. Take God out. No, no, I believe in Krishna. I'm, I, I am a, a sannyasi. But then in the way I act, I'm trying to take God out of the picture. I'll tell you what happened to me once. I was in one devotee's home and there was a beautiful picture of Krishna, Krishna Balaram. Beautiful frame. Right? So I was walking back and forth, chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. I was like, you know, you know, like sometimes you just feel like, oh, I'm so spiritual. <laughs> so I had my beads, I thought I was walking in front of the picture for one hour. And you know what I realized after one hour? Every single time I was walking towards the picture, instead of seeing Krishna, I was seeing my reflection in the glass of the picture frame. And I was like, this is amazing. You can be right in front of Krishna and be completely self-absorbed. Because we say we want God, but then we take God out of the picture. So, it's a real art, how to... And then, when your life is filled with the sweetness and beauty of God, then there's no room for illusion. Some thoughts, think about it. Do you want to say anything on that? Only crew. Oh, this is like the crew. Okay, wow. Oh, that's the name of the school. I see, I see, okay. It sounds like an Italian like mafia gang or something. Huh? Like the Poponi, we're gonna sh shoot you down. <laughs> like, okay, wow. Better watch out for these guys, you know. Yes, please. Um, Hare Krishna, I really appreciate all of your teachings and all of the guidance that you've given us. But um, I just wanted to ask, why do we always refer to God as a he? Why do we not refer to him as something, to, to God as something more universal? Why can it not be a she, for example? I, I, I don't know, it may be very... That's a great question. I, I'm not sure, but just why? Why is God always a he? Yeah. Why does it have to be a man? Why are men always on the top? I sometimes wonder also. <laughs> Shall I tell you something amazing? Uh, sometimes people ask me, do you believe in monotheism? No, first they ask me, do you believe in polytheism? You understand, like many gods? I'm like, no, no, we don't believe in polytheism. Then they're like, oh, so you're monotheistic. And I'm like, not quite. So then they're like, you're not polytheistic, you're not monotheistic, you're not atheistic, or you're like, no, no, I'm not, definitely not atheistic. So they're like, what are you? And you know what I tell them? We are polymorphic by monotheists. That's what we actually follow. Now let me break it down for you. We're monotheistic because we believe there's one God. There can't be two gods, because otherwise they'd probably be having an argument up there trying to decide who's the top person. Right, so there must be one God, monotheistic. But what the ancient scriptures explain 
is that what we are is that we're actually bi monotheists because we understand that God has a male and a female counterpart. God has a male uh, aspect and a female divinity. Therefore, Radha and Krishna. And we believe that that Radha and Krishna, who are the male and female aspects of divinity, are inseparable. And therefore, you'll never see that we worship Krishna without worshipping Radha. And that Radha and Krishna, who are the bi-monotheistic reality, are polymorphic in the sense that they then come to this world in different forms. And therefore, if you know something about Eastern traditions, there is Ram, but then there's, there's Narayan, but then there's because we never worship the male aspect of God alone. So actually, in the Vedic concept, um, divinity has a male and female aspect both. And they are, it's a very, very deep theology whereby they are separate and at the same time eternally one. And uh, maybe that subject will require a whole other seminar by Yadavendra Prabhu. But just to answer you, yeah, so um, in fact if you go to Vrindavan today, uh, watch out, you may lose your heart in Vrindavan as we saw here. But if you go to Vrindavan which is the home of Krishna, Vrindavan is the home of Krishna. But if you walk through the streets of Vrindavan, then they won't greet you with Krishna's name. You know whose name they'll greet you with, right? Radha. Radhe, Radhe. I'm telling you. Radhe. This is Krishna's home. No, no, no. Because the female divinity can conquer even the heart of the male divinity. And therefore, the male divinity, or Krishna, is actually uh, the servant of the female divinity. And therefore, they know the secret that actually... Um, in the highest sense, um, the female aspect of God supersedes. Some thoughts. It's a very deep question you asked, but I just offered some ideas and you can navigate it further. But thank you so much. It was a, such a beautiful question. It's amazing. Your school must be like a good school, like smart. All right, you want to go round two? You want to like <laughs> deplete your bank balance today? Um, so, to the last question, um, I read somewhere that um, Krishna is Purusha and uh, Radharani is Prakriti. So, um, there are many debates about this online, but um, is Prakriti or Radha complete without Krishna and is Krishna complete without Radha? Because some people say Radha is complete without Krishna and some people say Krishna is complete without Radha. So what's the actual truth? <laughs> you guys ask inconceivable questions. Okay. Radha and Krishna are complete in themselves. And at the same time, they're only really complete when they're together. Both are true. Language will come to its limits when trying to understand the spiritual reality. So if you say, tell me, no, Swami, tell me, is it A or is it B? I'm going to tell you it's both. Just like if I ask you a question, who came first, the father or the son? It's not a trick question. The father. It is a trick question. So you're going to say the father comes first, right? Before the son. Obviously. Wrong. Because until the son was born, was the man a father? So who comes first? The father or the son?
wrong. <laughs> as soon as the father is, as soon as the son is born, the man is a father. So is there any delay between when the father and son come about? So the father and son come about at the same time. Agree? There you go. I've just made you agree to three statements which are all contradictory, yet they're all true. Agree? Disagree? You could also disagree and that would also be agreeing because ultimately, <laughs> no, I'm joking. So like this, when we talk about the spiritual reality, we can't try to box it into our intellect. Therefore, um, we say some things are inconceivable. Conceiving something means you try to contain it within something. Like when a woman conceives a baby, then it's conceived within the womb, within boundaries. But the spiritual reality cannot be bound within boundaries. And therefore it's inconceivable. Does that make sense? Is going to ask a hard question. Um, so I was just going to ask um, on behalf of the Peponi clan um, what simple things can you do if you have little time as a student to. You guys all stuff? want shortcuts. So what, what simple things you can do if you want to? Sorry, I cut you off there. If you want to progress in bhakti. What simple things can you do? Of course, I spoke to Prabhu, I forgot, I don't know your name. Aditya. To Aditya, I said the three things. You remember the three things, right? So those three simple things you can do every day, right? So what does that mean in practical terms? Do five or ten minutes of chanting. You can do more. But I'm saying for those who haven't begun. Do a little bit of chanting every day. Second thing is try to connect more with spiritual friends. Right? If you have spiritual friends, then just by being around them, you're going to go further in your spiritual journey. So make as many spiritual friends as you can. Um, and then try to help them out and encourage each other. And then the third simple thing is do something nice for someone every day. In the world today they have something called random acts of kindness. Isn't it? So you can do a random act of spiritual kindness to someone every day. Just go out on the street and if you see someone looks hungry, give them something. If you see someone looks down or is struggling in their life, ask them, how are you doing? You want to talk about something? Just be kind to other people and uh, in that way the heart becomes very soft. And when the heart becomes soft, then you can really be a spiritual person. You can't be like, oh, oh, and then be spiritual. It's not possible. Okay? Be, be soft. Be kind. And uh, if you do that, you go far. But then, make a special effort. Don't always think about what's the least amount I can do to get the most benefit. If you want to achieve what other people don't achieve, you have to be ready to do what other people wouldn't do. So, don't just be ordinary. Be extraordinary. But to be extraordinary, you have to make an extraordinary effort. But then you'll achieve extraordinary things in your life. And then... Uh, you'll be very happy and your parents will be very happy. <coughs> Make sense? Yeah. Um, and 50, 50. Also like when you were a student, um, how did you not like 
just come into ISKCON, but how did you progress in ISKCON? How did I progress in ISKCON? Wow. How did I climb up the ISKCON ladder? I think um, progress in ISKCON is an interesting terminology. I see ISKCON as my family. I don't really see ISKCON or this religion as like uh, an institution. I'm like, these guys are my family. So when you talk about, you don't really progress in a family, right? It's not like, how did you progress in your family? You're just like, you love, you love your parents more, you love your sister more, you love your family more, and you just keep on doing more and more for them. And as you live together, then you just feel happier because you have better relationships. So for me, progressing in ISKCON just means to have better relationships, deeper relationships more spiritual relationships with everyone around me and that's real progress so I think that's the real for me progress like sometimes people are like oh you became a sannyasi that's such a great achievement and I'm kind of like I don't really see sannyas as an achievement it's an opportunity an opportunity to serve and if I use it to serve others then I develop more love for them. And if we develop a loving relationship, then life is beautiful. So it's not the goal of life to be a sannyasi. It's not the goal of life to have a position. I have all these titles. No. The real progress in life is do you have love in your heart? And if you have that, you're a rich person. Otherwise, you can have all the titles and all the accolades and all the achievements behind your name. BSc, MSc, PhD, MAD. <laughs> and still not happy. So it's all, yeah. I think you get my point. Is it? Okay, you are difficult to please today. <laughs> like, what in specific did you do? What in specific did I do? I tried to serve. I tried not to waste time. And I tried whenever there was the opportunity to serve someone, to be enthusiastic about it. Sometimes service was hard. Sometimes service was like, I don't want to do this. But I knew, whenever I serve, I always become happy. So even when it's hard, even on the mornings you feel tired, even on the times when you're like, I don't like that person. Still serve. And uh, I was sharing in the corporate program, one Indian writer said, I went to sleep and I dreamt that life was joy. I woke up and I realized life was service. But then I began to serve and I realized service is joy. So be, try to help others serve. Life becomes beautiful. Is everyone okay? Like, uh, we don't want to put you into an unconscious state. My voice has like a hypnotic, dreamy effect that can put, place people into very dangerous alpha states whereby you may not rise to normal consciousness again. So as long as you're okay, we can keep going. Are you okay? Yeah? Yes. questions that I've been listening to but everybody's scared to ask it so 
Uh, and this is not being disrespectful to you or anybody. It's just something in my head or our be open, some people's be open. head. This is, it. this is the moment we were waiting for. <laughs> okay. There is so much um, politics in the institution or the firm or whatever word we call it. And yet there is the other side where um, I have been exposed to Krishna consciousness, which I love. And um, in my own way, I'm, I, I am trying to achieve that rasa, as my family know. But I am full of contradiction as well. However, um, how do you negate or move, move away from... And this is a question and a hundred other questions in one. How do you, A, uh, move away from the negative thought that mm. the institution is, is actually causing you, me personally, more... Uh, how do I say it? It's, it's taking me away from my rasa. Mm. Because there's too much going on in this institution. Too many politics. Politics. And I'm not just saying it's gone or Tom, Dick and Harry or any, it's everywhere. It's, it could be even politics of a gov government. And the next question is, I have been asked several times by several loved ones, when are you going to take up a guru? Because you need a guru to advance in your consciousness. Now, I am not ready because I am not attracted to any guru except Shila Prabhupada, and that too very basic, which I, because my knowledge is minimal. But I am not attracted to any guru at the moment because of this drama that's been fed into my head. So, what do we do? Wow, <laughs> this one is for Yadavendra Prabhu? No, no, this is, no, 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 this is not for Yadav. <laughs> Definitely not for Yadav, this is for you. This is for me, oh my goodness me, okay. Sorry if I was No, no, we're very happy. Uh, your nice, honest questions. Yes, the world is full of politics. Uh, outside of ISKCON, and dare I say it, even within ISKCON. After all, we're living in the material world. In the scriptures it's mentioned, Kaler dosha nidhe rajan astihe ko mahanguna Kirtana Deva Krishnasya Mukta Sangha Param Brajet. We're living in Kali Yuga and it's a Doshani day. Wherever you look, there's faults. It's hard to go anywhere and not see any faults. Everyone has faults. But could it be my fault that I'm mirroring? Yeah, yeah, that's also a fault. Yeah. Our faults compound the faults that we see in others. Yeah. And therefore, the nature of this world is that wherever you go, whoever you go, you will always see some faults. But a Vaishnava is known as Sara Grahi. You understand this word? Grahi means to grasp. And Sar means the essence. In other words, we know how to take the essence, the good thing, from everything in this world. We tell people even a broken clock tells the right time twice a day. Right? So when you live in this world, you're going to be surrounded by faults. But the trick of living in this world and living in ISKCON spiritually is don't focus on the negative, but rather accept the negative, be educated from the negative, become wiser and more mature from seeing the negative and then get inspired by the positive. Sometimes you can also learn a lot of things from people doing things wrong. I'll tell you a great way to learn. Just look at everything everyone's doing wrong and just be like, I need to make sure I don't do that in my life. You become very wise. But then see that there are wonderful examples. I lived, uh, as we all, many of us have, I lived on the inside of ISKCON for 25 years. Right. On the inside, you see it all. One time someone came to me, he was like, I'm not into organized religion. I'm like, you're going to love us, we're completely disorganized. <laughs> right. So I've lived in the inside, I've seen many, many things, as we all have. But you know what I've also seen? I've seen saints. 
some people think saints are from the past. Some people think saints are the ones we read about in books. I can tell you with my hand on my heart that I have seen people with my eyes who are saintly, who have no other desire save and accept to serve God completely selflessly. And therefore, in my life, what I try to do is focus on that example. Our tendency in life is to always look at the lower examples and then descend to that lower standard. Whereas what we can do is we can look for the, those who are flying, those who are doing well and say, I want to go there. And so that's what I've tried to do, is try to see the good. Uh, be a Sada Grahi Vaishnav. And on your second point about the Guru, I think it's a very individual thing. I was living in the temple for many years before I got initiated. Because I felt it wasn't the right time for me. But then at a certain point I realized, unless I get a spiritual teacher, I can't go further. So then I began to desire that, pray for that, look for that. And when I did those three things, I desired it, I prayed for it, and I looked for it. And then it came, then it happened. So you're going on your journey, it's a very beautiful journey, and we're all on our own timeline. So respect your timeline, honor your timeline, and in time I'm sure everything will happen. These are some thoughts, I hope it helps in some way. That's something. I'll just share um, one thing. And I'm speaking for myself, I'm not speaking for anybody else. Do you know sometimes <clears throat> we enter a place and we see that there's politics in that place because suddenly there's friction, someone speaks to us badly um, and, and the whole scenario becomes a little bit negative. And the reason is almost because We've walked in with a gun. We've actually walked into the situation with a gun. We think we're not doing anything. We think, oh, I didn't load the gun, I didn't point it at you. But the fact is, our very presence creates a little bit of a threat because of the way we are. So it's almost like when you walk in with a gun, right? And I've seen this happen once. Someone was talking to me and they just took out their gun and they placed it on the table and they said, let's talk. And it was about business. It wasn't like, let's talk and like, you know, let, let's shoot each other. They just took out a gun and put it on the table. And I kind of just sat there for like a few minutes and I'm like, I don't want to talk to you. Right? So the point is that if we have this energy of, a, of being a threat, and that's why I said I'm speaking about myself here, because I recognize that in my nature, right? We will make everyone uncomfortable, and so therefore, it's just a matter of time before someone fires a bullet, because we've walked in like that. And I always think back to this example, that for me to be really saintly, I have to walk everywhere without a gun, which means no threat to anybody. Very, very easy. I hope that's okay. It's 8.30. There's a question. Thank you so much. Um, I know we've all asked different spiritual questions, but Mine is a bit different because I'm neither Indian or Kenyan. I'm Nigerian and our tradition is very different. But then coming here, I have fell in love with this fellowship and I've been studying more on it. But then I came across numerology and my question is, I'm life, life part nine. How does that affect my spirituality? 
Can, can you say the last thing again? Your life part nine. Life part nine. Okay. Part I'm not familiar so much. Are you familiar with numerology? Okay. Is anyone here familiar with me? Can you can you explain what that means? Yeah. Okay. From my studies, it says like this is. Life part. Yes. Life part nine. So from my studies, it's saying this is my last chance. And if I don't gain uh, highest form of spirituality in this lifeline, I may not get an opportunity again. It's like your ninth life. Yes. Okay, all right. So that's, yeah. Like they say, cats have nine lives, like that. Mm -hmm. Something like that, okay. All right, so that's interesting. So your question is that according to your numerology, this is like your last chance. And if you don't make it in this, then... Then what happens? Then you might not get another chance again. Okay, wonderful. According to the spiritual teachings of the Vedas, we are spirit souls. Okay, this body is a machine. It's one chapter of life. We've lived before and will continue to live after this life. The soul can never be destroyed. Like they say, even in Newton's laws, Energy cannot be created or destroyed, but simply transferred. So according to the philosophy of the East, there will always be another chance. There will never come a point in the soul's journey where the soul reaches a dead end. Because God's love is infinite, because God's compassion is boundless and because God's mercy has no end, there can never be a point where the soul is doomed. However, what it can be is that in this life you have a golden opportunity that you may not get for a long time thereafter. That the Vedic scripture says is true. And therefore, this opportunity we have to be with spiritual people and to genuinely develop spiritual love within our heart, it may be an opportunity that we were looking for for lifetimes. And what the Vedic scriptures say is that if we don't manage to take advantage in this life, then we may end up going on a long, long journey to come back to have this opportunity again. And therefore, we should really take advantage and, uh, and not waste it. It's almost like, you know, runners go on a marathon. right? They run miles and miles and miles. And then what happens is right at the end of the race, they enter the stadium. And then when they come in the stadium, they have to do one lap. And when they enter the track, then there's a bell, which signifies this is the final lap. So on the soul's journey, you've gone through a whole marathon of many, many lifetimes to come here. And now it's like you're on in the stadium. The crowd are cheering. The bell is ringing. And you're in that last round to get to the finish line. And can you imagine after someone has run a whole marathon, if they get to the last thing and they're winning, and then just 100 meters before the end, they're like, oh no, I give up. And it's like, oh no. Isn't it? So it's like that. The soul has gone through a long journey to come to this point. So we shouldn't underestimate the great opportunity we have. But the spiritual literature say you'll never hit a dead end. So even if we don't make it in this life, there will be another opportunity, when it will be, that we don't know. Is that okay? All right, so, or is that a flick of the flinch there? I think, uh, yeah, we can, we have to show them and then, is it? So we have time for just, uh, just maybe one last question, oh. if anyone has a question. Okay, Rajit Prabhu, maybe you ask your question directly. Yeah? 
Okay. So I'll just pass the mic back. Hare Krishna. Um, my question is a very simple question. Uh, there's a lot of elevated, uh, spiritually elevated people here. I'm a bit of a late bloomer. I'm just, it's like a beginning towards uh, spirituality. I don't have much knowledge, but I do enjoy the kirtan part, the chanting part, um, going to temples. Uh, I have a question uh, which I get confused about, especially when I go to temples. There's the aspect of gratitude when I go and I, I, I express my gratitude uh, for this beautiful life and everything. And then there's this other part where I want to ask for something. So like, for example, good health for a, for a parent. So I just wanted to know your view about gratitude and asking. Um, you know, there's the confusion. Should I ask or should I express my gratitude or just accept what's happening around me, uh, to myself, to my loved ones. Thank you so much for asking that very honest question. Um, yeah, we often come in front of God with a shopping list. I want a house by the sea, a color TV, 50 million gigabyte MP3, Jay Jagadish, Shahare. So we often have so many desires, we come in front of God, isn't it? In the, in the UK they have the lottery, and before they spin the numbers, they all have a mantra. God, I know I'm a sinner, but make me a winner. <laughs> it's funny actually, at the temple, like uh, we get these envelopes, you know, and they're, they're addressed to Swami. I don't know who, it, uh, somehow by default they come to me. But um, I open these envelopes sometimes and they're like, My son's exams are coming up. Please find donation enclosed. <laughs> it's like, okay, we'll say a prayer. Hopefully it makes it. So yeah, we come in front of God with so many desires. So should we ask, should we be asking for all these things? In spirituality, there's a progression. Most people don't even come to God. They're just trying to achieve all of those things by their own efforts. But then when one becomes a little bit spiritual, one realizes there's a higher power, someone who is very kind, someone who controls everything. I can ask them. Maybe they'll help. So that's higher. That's wonderful. People come to God, they recognize that there's someone who is kind to me, who will help. But you know, later on, you go beyond that. Because later on you realize all of these things that I ask God for, do they really make me happy? Sometimes even after getting all of these things, we still look in our heart and it's very empty. Yes, I have the house by the sea, the color TV, the academic degree. Well, I could have gone further there with that poetry. But... but my heart is still empty. Back to square one. Once there was a husband, wife and a child. And a genie appeared and he said, one wish each. He first went to the husband husband said, I need to go away to the spiritual world, to heaven, separate from everyone around me. So, boom, he went up to heaven. So he was enjoying in heaven by himself, no hassle, dare I say, no wife. <laughs> and then the genie came to the wife and said, what do you want? She said, I want to be with my husband. So he's up there and having a good time. A whoomp! His wife appears and says, oh no! And then they looked at each other and thought, anyway, at least we're in heaven. And then the genie came to the son and said, what do you want? He goes, I just want my parents back. And then there the heavens opened up, boom, they came straight flying down. 
And there they were, back together in the material world, after all their wishes fulfilled, back to square one. So after some time, you know what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita? Yehi samsparsha jaboga dukkayonaya evate adhyanta vanta konteya nate shu ramate buddha. Krishna says, when one becomes a Buddha, wise person, then they realize Adi and Anta. Every single type of material happiness in this world has a beginning and an end. And therefore, Nate Shu, Ramate. Ramate means to play or to enjoy or to relish. It says, Nate Shu, Ramate. They don't get involved in all these things anymore. They realize these things are not going to make me happy. So therefore, let me just go to God, be grateful for everything that He's given me, and ask Him now, introduce me to a rasa, a taste, which is beyond the temporary things of this world. And, uh, but in the beginning, if we're not there, if we have some problem in our life, my daughter is not married yet. She's 27. She's not married. Krishna, find her a husband. It's okay. You can do it. No problem. But later on you'll realize that even when God fulfills all our desires, if we haven't found inner happiness, even in all of those situations, we won't find any happiness. Isn't it? So, start from where you are. By all means, go to God, be honest. But then later on, naturally, we'll go beyond. Some thoughts. Thank you. In the interest of keeping time, I think we may have to end our public session.